Hey, everybody. How are all of you? Come on in here. Bum, 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 bum. It's time for Coffee with Scott Adams and the Simultaneous Sip, the best part of your day. It's where you get that little dopamine advantage that will carry you through the rest of the day, and I'm here to give it to you. It starts with the unparalleled pleasure of the simultaneous sip, and you know what you need, a cup or a glass or a mug, a tankard, a stein, or a chalice, possibly a thermos, maybe a flask, any kind of a vessel that holds a liquid. I like coffee. Join me now for the simultaneous sip. So in a little bit, uh, I'm going to have a guest on here, which is why I have my fancy headset on, looking quite professional, I like to think. Um, And while I'm waiting for the guest to join, and by the way, Tom, if you're looking at how to join, if you haven't done this before, you should be on a mobile device because it only works on mobile. It will not work on your laptop. And look for the little happy faces icon at the bottom of your screen. And that is how you request to join. Um, And I see somebody has requested to join. Let's see if that is Tom. Not yet. Okay. So um, let's talk about a few other things while we're waiting for that. Oh, the fun. The fun today. So... um, (laughs) <laughs> there was an article in uh, National Review by Kevin Williamson in which he said a number of things are not real, and people asked my opinion. And the things that uh, he, that Kevin Williamson labels as not real are things such as cults and stuff that Freud said and recovered memories and brainwashing. So Kevin saying that those things are not real. Now, I agree with him on most of these things. Oh, I see Tom is here, and we'll get to him as soon as I finish these comments. Um, I agree with most of those comments. I'll tell you what I agree with and what I don't. I agree that calling one thing a cult and another thing a religion doesn't make sense. (laughs) Because the difference between a cult and a religion... That's more of an opinion, and so I would agree with him that that labeling some things cults, uh, you can't really justify that. A religion that you don't believe in looks like a cult to you. He says recovered memories are not real. I believe that is correct. I believe that uh, the stories of recovered memories are really stories of people imagining things and talking themselves into thinking they're true. But, and then he also says that a lot of the beliefs about Freud and the Freudian analysis are also based on no science. And that's true, too. Freud was, we know now, a fraud. But here's where we disagree. He says there's no such thing as brainwashing, but he's careful to say brainwashing as it is popularly described in movies and popular culture. So his, his definition might be a little restricted, and maybe that's why he says it doesn't exist. But I say brainwashing absolutely exists. <laughs> All right, remember, I, I don't know what Kevin Williamson's background is, but I'm a trained hypnotist. I, I have hypnotized people, and I can tell you that you can change people's preferences. And what is a person if not a bundle of preferences? Because you're not your memory, exactly. You know, because you could put your memory in your phone and that doesn't make your phone you. So you're not your memory, you're not your body, because you could lose an arm, but you're still you. You are largely the thing that makes you special, besides your genetic makeup, is your preferences. And those can be fairly easily changed by other people. So do you call that brainwashing? Well, here's the thing. Kevin Williamson already said that recovered memories are not real. If a recovered memory is not real, 
what happened to the person who had the recovered memory? They were brainwashed. <laughs> so not intentionally, but a person with a recovered memory is usually a memory that has been, um, let's say, installed by the person asking the questions. So, for example, in the famous case of the uh, McMartin preschool, the law enforcement people asked questions of the children in a way that were sort of leading questions that would cause them to believe they had a memory they didn't have. So that's a well-documented case where the police brainwashed children. They brainwashed them into thinking they had experiences they never had. Very common. Um, wouldn't you say that Trump derangement syndrome is based entirely on brainwashing. It is. Um, most of what you see as politics is actually just brainwashing. It's not one side. If you think the other side is brainwashing and the side that you happen to join was the one that doesn't do any brainwashing, I'm sorry. You, you, you don't understand much about how the world works. Everybody's being brainwashed all the time. It, you know, it, it influences us in different ways, different people, but you're all being brainwashed. Pretty much, um, as I've said before, try to find somebody in the real world who has a political opinion that doesn't match the news network they watch. It's rare. People get their opinions assigned to them, and then they believe it's their opinions. It becomes their opinions. But brainwashing is the, I would say, I would say the opposite of brainwashing doesn't exist. I'm going to say as opposite as possible. Almost everything you believe is assigned to you. So you are mostly a brainwashed creature. Mostly. We're probably 90% brainwashing and 10% you know, genetics and randomness and stuff like that. So that's my, my take on it. Now, Let's see if we can bring Tom on here. I made you wait long enough. All right. Tom, can you hear me? Um, terrific. Tom, can you help me with the pronunciation of your last name? Sauer. Tom Sauer. Sauer. S-A-U-E-R. That's correct. Right. Um, and I understand you have some experience with... Uh, with mines and demolition, can you tell us your experience? Because this is relative to the Iranian and the tanker situation. That's correct. Uh, I am a uh, former Navy EOD officer. EOD stands for Explosive Ordnance Disposal. We're the bomb squad for the Navy and for special operations. So you've seen limpet mines, the kind that are, are allegedly being used on these uh, tankers in the Gulf of Oman. Is that correct? That is correct. Generally speaking, that's correct. I can't speak to the specific mine that was used there, uh, but generally speaking, yes, we, we trained on those and we're familiar with them. Yeah. So the first thing I'd ask is you saw the uh, videos, uh, the grainy videos of what is allegedly a, an Iranian, maybe a revolutionary guard boat removing something from the hull. Would you say, based on your experience, that is probably a limpet mind, definitely a limpet mind, or how would you characterize that? Uh, see, it's hard to say because I did see the photos from USS Bainbridge, which was on scene. They took some photographs and put that out as part of the official Navy statement, and they showed the blast from one, and they showed another black object. I can't tell for sure. You know, I mean, it, it seems like it would have been, but what threw me off was watching these guys come up in the boat, and it looks like they're doing something right in the same spot where the other picture had that alleged limpet mine. Right. And the thing is, is that we look at this and look, I acknowledge that there's other nations of smaller countries or less developed countries and their military and their EOD forces are very limited in their capability, in their training, their what we call TTPs, tactics, training procedures. And if, uh, and so we look at that, and I'm looking at like, well, that's just the day one. You don't do that, right? What's, <laughs> that's like the first day is you don't walk up on something that's armed, even if it's dud fired, right? You assume, okay, assuming it misfired and didn't work correctly. Well, what that tells you is that, well, that piece of ordinance, and this is whether it's a limpet mine, a hand grenade, uh, an IED, whatever, it doesn't matter, is like, well, okay, that thing's angry. Right. And that, and right. the thing is, is if you go and put your hands on that thing or worse, even approach it, 
that's just like a big, big no, no. That's why we have robots, right? And, <laughs> you know, that's why you see in the, in, you know, in the movies, and everything, we send a uh. robot in and that's why we have a guy wearing a bomb suit. And furthermore, if you have to send somebody down range, you don't put a boat with a dozen guys on it, like a little <laughs> boat. And so that's why I initially just question this is I'm like, I, I, I'm looking at this like, okay, this is either not a limpet mine or these guys are really, really dumb. And like, look, you don't have to have a whole lot of training or any training. You don't have to be in a UD guy to figure, Hey, let's have this boat full of a dozen guys. We're all going to stand on the bow and stand around it while Ahmed, you know, goes and puts his hands on the thing and yanks it off. Well, I, let me, let, let me ask you this. Uh, have you accounted for any cultural differences? In other words, uh, would it be culturally, um, let's say, acceptable for the people who were not the ones actually reaching up to this alleged limpid mind, would it be acceptable for them to be cowering in fear at the back of the boat? Or you know, that's, it... that's a good question I hadn't thought of. And, you know, uh, if that's the case for another country, or in another culture, if they want to do that, they can go and have that part of their culture, uh, you know, as far as I'm <laughs> concerned. But uh, anybody else, you know, uh, if they said, hey, we're all going to go up here, I would say, now, can I transfer over to the other boat? Now, did, uh, it, that, yeah. did, did it look to you um, as though there was any place to hide on that small boat? I mean, was, was there even a I, I don't remember it clearly. Did it even have a below deck? It was a Hengen, uh, what, Hengen class uh, patrol boat, right? Which is real common. I spent you know a fair bit of time out there, and those are those are pretty common. You see those guys all the time. I, uh, I've interacted with the I, IRGCN a lot, and they and I can tell you some funny stories about those guys. They point rockets at us. They call us up on the radio and say obscene things to us. They play pornography on the radio to just kind of mess, try to mess with our heads. They're real friendly. <laughs> um, but, uh, but what the thing is, it was on that boat. Uh, I, yeah, I, I mean, at least go to the other side, maybe that's, you, you know what I mean? I, 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 your, well, your best friend but, against an explosion isn't but, actually armor. It's distance. All right. But, but, but you get my point. Yeah. If they, if they thought that there was nothing they could do to be particularly safe, right. they might just say, oh, well, we're not going to act like we're you know, a bunch of cowards. We'll just stand up here and see. Yeah, in solidarity with their buddies, I suppose you could say that. <laughs> um, maybe that is a cultural thing, it, it, you know, perhaps. But that's what I thought. When I was looking at this, I'm like, that doesn't make any sense. However, when I saw <laughs> right. some of these other photos, and it's worth pointing out, yesterday the New York Times column about it, and I was actually in the middle of writing on the same topic for human events with, uh, for uh, Will Chamberlain and Raheem Kassam. I was in the middle of write, writing something for that because I was asking a lot of these questions. But then there's a New York Times column that came up, and it actually had some um, – it looks like they changed the filter on the, on the video footage. You can see a little bit more clearly. And it really does. Like, wow, okay, maybe they just were that dumb. And they actually did do what I didn't think that they would, and it looks like they actually did it. Well, keep, keep, in, mind, keep in mind that if they got the order to do this and they didn't do it – um, you know, they're, they're sort of dead. They got two ways to be right. dead. And, and this one was the low, this one was probably the low risk path. What, Pro probably. Should... And they were just being kind of, you know, maybe they just decided, Hey, we're just going to be really stupid about it. And if we're going to stand around, you know, I, I'm, I'm sure they're probably had to change and do a lot of laundry afterwards. Cause I would have been pissing my pants if I had to do that. Now, um, so, and what are, in your opinion, having seen what you've seen, is there any, chance that it isn't exactly what it looks like which is the revolutionary guard put some mines on some ships is, is there any chance is anything but that good question um it seems like you know one thing we do learn in, in eod is that you know if it looks like a duck and walks like a duck it's probably a duck i mean it really is just kind of like you know use the occam's razor approach i have thought about yeah. if there's something nefarious going on I mean, yeah, I guess it's possible, but I mean, I, I know what that boat is. That is an IRGCM boat. You can tell from, you know, from just just from that the uh, the footage there, even though it's not color and doesn't have markings, you can't see the markings at least. That is an Iranian patrol boat. Now, if there was something else on there and not an explosive device, I mean, maybe, but why, probably Yeah, why not. would it be? Yeah, why, right, why right, would it be? be? Right. And also, for, it's worth pointing out that the Iranians know – they know that we had our eyes on everything in the area. Because now it says that they shot down or tried to shoot down one of our surveillance drones. We also had, you know, other, whenever we have that entire part of the world mapped out, we're watching everything. And especially after an incident like that, 
there are multiple cameras on scene 24 hours a day. You have surveillance aircraft and surveillance drones. So they had to know that they were being watched. And, and the Iranians know yeah. this too. Here's, a, here's what I've been watching for. I've been yeah. watching for the Iranians to specifically deny that that, what do you call it, a ship or a boat? What's the proper? Uh, a patrol boat, a PB, or a you know, boat? We call it a, right. yeah, a boat. Uh, yeah. I've been looking for them to say that's not our boat. Because if they don't say that's not our boat, as ridiculous as that might sound to us, if right. they can't say that directly, it's their freaking boat. Oh, because, it is definitely their boat, for right. sure. And, and if they did not, if they haven't denied it, there you go. Now, let me ask you this. I, I don't know if you know enough about the politics in Iran. You probably study that area more than I do. But what are the odds that the uh, the Revolutionary Guard? could be acting somewhat independently from even the rest of the civilian government. What, what are the odds that the president of Iran, who of course is subsidiary, you know, he's subservient to the uh, grand, the grand leader of the Ayatollah. Uh, what are the chances that the civilian leader even knows necessarily what's happening? He, That's he actually possible. And I'll tell you why. Um, Iran has two navies. People maybe don't realize it. You have the Iranian Navy, which is actually professional, force with, I mean, where they follow the rules. They're actually very professional when it comes to interacting with American ships. They have uh, P3, you know, observation aircraft that I've been flown over. They've flown over me a bunch. And they're actually like uniformed, professional, you know, they act like adults, so to speak, right? Uh, and then you have another Navy, which is called the IRGCN, the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps Navy, which is a paramilitary outfit. It is pretty much siloed off from the rest of the Iranian military. It's strictly for political purposes, and they're the ones who are the troublemakers. They're in the little boats. They also like do things like the, they ride around in Boston whalers with machine gun mounts and <laughs> rocket launchers like welded onto them, and they're a different animal, and they do answer to different bosses. So now that is, is possible. Now, is the Revolutionary Guard, is their primary job to protect the leaders from the population, their own population? Is that their primary goal? Uh, that would be speculation. I'll, I'll be honest. Like, I took a Middle Eastern Studies class at the, when I was at the Naval Academy, um, and you know that's about it. I, I'm not going to pretend to be a Middle East expert. Okay. But generally speaking, uh, yeah, I, I'd say that's true. It's very much a political uh, paramilitary unit. It's, they're not the same as the regular military. Yeah. Um, well, somebody's somebody's challenging me in the comments that Rouhani, President Rouhani, uh, had to know what was going on. I, let me let me modify my speculation to I don't know that he was necessarily in on the planning of it. <laughs> but if he watched the same video we did, yes, of course, he knows they did it. Uh, sure. Of, cor of course, he knows now. But I don't necessarily think he knew before it happened. That, I think that that's would... a fair speculation. I think that'd be a fair speculation, yeah. I mean, but obviously we don't know. Nobody knows. None of us were there. But, I mean, from what we're seeing now, I think that's a pretty that, – that's fair. That's reasonable. Now, I heard that uh, that they fired at one of our drones. They tried – they fired a missile at our drone, and then, then you read down the article, and it says uh, the closest the missile came to our drone was a kilometer. And yeah. I'm thinking – I'm not really worried about the Iranian military now if the closest they could get to a drone and you know drones not moving that fast right I would think No they're they're not and and, and no, that's absolutely a very good point when they're shooting at it they're they're not very effective at those sorts of things <laughs> uh, one thing I would I would say to tell people to watch and you can find this in open source so I'm not like giving anything away is if we were to really start to schwack Iran we we really wanted to hurt them and like it's going all out which I still think is highly unlikely but right. your tell for that will not be, oh, we moved more carrier strike groups and more ships into the Persian Gulf. No, 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 no. What's going to happen is when every Navy asset gets out of the Persian Gulf, because that means the U.S. Air Force is coming in and there won't be. And the only thing of the Iranian Navy <laughs> that's left but that's still floating will be what the U.S. Air Force decides to allow. To be <laughs> right. I can tell you that right now. Watch that, and that's all you can find on open source. I mean, that's that's not that's no big secret. Right. So if all of a sudden you hear about the U.S. Navy getting out of the Persian Gulf, that's where you watch out. So, so, uh, but that also raises a, a question I've been wondering. It feels to me like sure, it's great to have a navy because all the all the reasons that you would need one. But if you ever got into a real war, wouldn't a hundred percent of every major naval vessel be sunk? I mean, on both uh, sides. If, 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 let's say we got into a war with a, with a serious country, with a serious military. Like China. I mean, yeah, I mean, not that China. we would. 
Would, right, would right. It, wouldn't it be about one week before everything that floated is not floating anymore on both sides? It, it very well could be. It would be uh, a modern naval engagement these days would be very short and very violent. Right. There wouldn't I be anything left, way. I think. It pro- 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 probably not. Well, not a lot of luck. We would take some licks, and, but we'd deliver them back, too. And that was something I actually worked on as my, part of my part-time job. One of my staff jobs, I was a planning officer. We wrote war plans. Actually, part of the war plan for Korea has my fingerprints on it. A very tiny part. One of the staff got. Oh, somebody, somebody in the comments is, says, uh, what about submarines? Yeah, the submarines would be tougher. So It, it would be, but here's the interesting thing. For Iran, one thing that's to, to note is there aren't that – it isn't a very big area for submarine activity because it's very closely confined. I mean, the Persian Gulf is not that big, and yeah. also the water is very shallow overall. Mm-hmm. It's very shallow water, so it's not a lot of place for you to hide or run around. There are some submarines out there, obviously some smaller ones. Um, we can get into that. Jack Posobiec and I have talked about that at length, but, um, yeah, that's one of the things as well that it, it wouldn't be too much of a submarine fight. There is a possibility for that, but also the real concern is in the Persian Gulf, the Strait of Hormuz is if the Iranians were to mine it and they do have a lot of mines. That's one of the things we always worry about all the time because they can shop all, stop all that shipping traffic and it only take, it doesn't even take one mine to stop all that shipping traffic. That's why everyone gets so nervous. All you, all the Iranians have to do is start throwing barrels into the water. And people would start now, freaking out. Now, uh, what is the situation with the Iranian? Um, w- don't they have their own need for shipping? I mean, in other words, if all shipping stopped, wouldn't uh, Iran be in a lot of trouble? It would hurt everybody. That's one of the things. That's one of the reasons why they haven't done anything like that yet. They're very careful about some of these things, and which also made me call into question. You know, what, what, what do the Iranians have to gain by doing this, really? I'm not really sure. If anything, this will just provoke more. It's more provocative, and it doesn't really seem to help them at all. I found it interesting that the Arab states all of a sudden got real fired up. You know, say, you know, America, we got to do something, you know. And I'm like, oh, that's <laughs> interesting. Who benefits out of this? Yeah. You know? So th- this is what makes me think that Iran might be a bit fractured at the moment. I've got a feeling that they're not all on board with Whatever, whatever's happening there, that's just a feeling. That's a that's a good feeling to have. I I, I think you might be right. All right. Well, so Tom, here's here's uh, some persuasion I've been working on to help us with Iran, and I I previewed it in my earlier question. What kind of country needs a military to protect its leaders from its own population? And that's that's sort of what the Revolutionary Guard is, in my opinion, right? Yeah, generally speaking, I'd say that's correct, yeah. So I would think that that would be a great framing because instead of making it the United States against Iran, it's pretty clear that we're on the same side as the population of Iran because there, we we both have the military between us and the leadership of Iran, which is not helping either their citizens or anybody else. So in a way, we have a common enemy, and it's the Revolutionary Guard. So I would agree with that. Man, I think it is, that is good. And, and oh, I mean, we've, there's been attempts, you know, I mean, there was an attempt at a revolution, you know, another revolution, counter-revolution, what, 2013, I think it was, several years ago. They've tried for that as well. And, I mean, it's uh, it's it's too bad, the state of Iran, it's, uh, it's such incredible potential coming out of that yeah. country. Right. All right, Tom, thank you so much for that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go Thank you so much, Scott. All right, take care. Cheers. All right, that was great. Um, let's talk about some other things. So um, I was talking yesterday about how the, the news has not covered President Trump's um, incremental progress on health care. When I say incremental process, I mean there have been a number of smaller actions by the administration that would improve the free market, uh, free market mechanism of health care that should lower costs in the long run increased competition, um, increased choice, that sort of thing. And there was this announcement that didn't get much coverage about uh, HRAs and something about small businesses using pre-tax dollars for health care. And I was watching uh, Dr. Nicole Sapphire try to explain this on, uh, what was it, Fox and Friends? And, <laughs> and it was frustrating because the topic is just too complicated to really communicate. Uh, I, you know, I think uh, Dr. Sapphire knew the topic, but she had to somehow, in, in a minute, communicate this to people who don't have the same context and background and 
uh, even when you say pre-tax dollars, if you say to the average American citizen, hey, this is pretty good because this will be pre-tax dollars, do you know what the average citizen says? Uh, uh, what's, is that important? I mean, pre-tax? I don't know. Is that good? Is that bad? Um, so that whole story about the HRAs is completely wasted. It might be a good policy, and it might give us some good results, and someday we might look back and say, hey, I'm sure glad about that. But I'm a small business owner. I mean, what I do here is a small business, and I wouldn't know how to do anything differently because of this. What did the HRA do for me? Or I don't know. So it's this completely poorly communicated field. Um, what the administration needs is some kind of an expert on simplifying and communicating. And if you would like me to recommend some administration, I can do that. But you seriously need some communication people working on packaging and marketing all the things that you're doing for healthcare costs so that it's, it's a coherent story and not a bunch of muddled complexity. Um, I saw a poll that says Biden is leading and uh, in terms of a hypothetical matchup with President Trump, and, uh, and the way it was presented in the story was that uh, the poll says the voters want a, quote, steady leader. So they're looking at Joe Biden as a, quote, steady leader. And I thought to myself, that is the best kill shot ever for Joe Biden. Because if there's one thing you can, you can be assured of is that the more we see of him, the more there will be things that people will label a flip-flop, more things where he stutters and falters, more things where he has to you know, um, clarify something he said. The normal, the, the normal give and take of a campaign produces lots of, lots of unsteadiness. So unsteadiness is a guaranteed outcome of pretty much anybody running for president. There will be moments they're, they're accused credibly accused of, yeah, having a gaffe, having, saying something wrong, having to correct something, flip-flopping from their previous statements, etc. So the last thing you want, if, if you're the Joe Biden campaign, the last thing you want is to hear the media labeling you as the steady candidate because it's a label you can't live up to. Nobody could. You know, Trump couldn't live up to it. Nobody could. Um, and I, I know that the steady is the, the counter to Trump's unpredictability. But the unpredictability is giving us pretty definite benefits at this point. I think even critics understand, the, the worst Trump critics understand at this point, that the president's unpredictability has helped him in negotiations. Uh, it's helped us unambiguously. So that's a terrible thing. A terrible label to put on Biden is steady. Because that's, that's just going to blow up like a limpet mind. All right, mine. Um, George Stephanopoulos was talking to President Trump, and one of the questions he asked him was about the UFOs and the alleged videos of UFOs that our, our military our aircraft have taken. And he was, the president was asked if he believes. Now, keep in mind that President Trump has access to everything. Yeah, there, there's no such thing as uh, information that's too confidential for the president of the United States. So whatever we know, the president knows, because certainly he's asked, right? At the, you know, since the topic came up, he's certainly asked his people, well, tell me the secret stuff. Do we have any UFOs or not? Here was the president's response about does he believe in UFOs. He said, do I believe it? Not particularly. <laughs> <laughs> now, not particularly leaves him that, you know, that little bit of an out, which is, well, you know, I'm not saying they don't exist. I'm just saying I'm not particularly convinced of it. And he's seen, he's seen the stuff that we can see. So whatever it is that's out there that has been seen, the president has looked at it and said, not particularly. Now, if there's one thing you should trust the president on, it's identifying BS. Because when you happen to be a manufacturer of as much BS as any politician, but this president's better at it than most, 
uh, let's call it hyperbole. If you're, if you're a, uh, one of the best manufacturers of, let's say, uh, <laughs> hyperbole, you can kind of recognize it when other people are doing it. You can recognize BS if you are a BSer. And when the president, who has access to the best information in the world on the question of UFOs, says, do you believe it? Not particularly. Uh, I am in the same camp. No matter how many videos you show uh, of what looks like a grainy picture of a UFO, I don't believe it. Now, the most famous one is that one that would seem to be traveling at a high speed, and it looks like they locked onto it, and you know, at one point it looks like it, it turned sideways and it was still moving. That sideways turn is what tells me it wasn't real. Do you know the video I'm talking about? There's one where there's a craft that looks like it's going this way, and then at some point it turns this way and it keeps going. And I'm thinking to myself, that's exactly how nobody ever made a, a, a craft. There, there's, no, there's no aircraft that works well in one direction but also works in the sideways direction. Because you got air, you got, you got issues with that, right? So I don't believe uh, that UFOs... I don't believe UFOs have visited us. That's my, my take. <clears throat> nor do I believe we'll ever find them. But that's a longer question. Let's talk about burning the flag. Oh, no, let's talk about um, Reparation H. So somebody on the Internet, and I wish I could give credit because it's pretty funny, has referred, has given a name to Kamala Harris at, because Kamala believes in reparations. And she also, her last name starts with H, Harris. But she also believes in hoaxes. Uh, one of them is the fine people hoax and several other hoaxes she believes in. So somebody gave her the name Reparation H. And I thought to myself, I like that. That's a keeper. Because Reparation H just is, is funny, so that's, that's good. If it's funny, that's a good start. But funny isn't enough. If the H stands for hoax, it signals people that she's someone who believes in every hoax. And if you, if you use Reparation H, use the H for hoax, not for Harris. That's, that's what I would uh, uh, advise you. And the reason is, if you use the H for hoax, then every time she mentions one, you will be reminded of it and it will be reinforcing. That's what the president does with his nicknames. He picks things which will be reinforcing in the, in the normal scheme of things you know it will be reinforced by events. So the hoax one would definitely be reinforced. So she has tweeted once again the fine people hoax. Here's what's interesting. I, of course, retweeted that and called out the fact that she was repeating a hoax. When I used to do that, I would, I would just be trashed in the statements, people saying, my God, how can you say this is a hoax? Today, when I retweet it, only a few people say, <laughs> hey, why are you calling that a hoax? I'm sure that happened. And far more people are saying, okay, yes, here comes another hoax. So I believe that the, that the, uh, the weight has turned, that uh, the people who believe it's true are now on the, on the defensive, as they should be. Let's talk about flag burning. So there's some amendment... Uh, or there's some um, legislation floating around in which, uh, I guess, Senator Steve Daines proposed an amendment for a strong ban on burning our American flag. And the president supported that in a tweet and called it a no-brainer. And um, other people supported him. Candace Owens, for example, said, if I were president, the punishment for burning the U.S. flag would be the renunciation of citizenship. That's, that's pretty drastic. No jail time, no fine. Simply one year to liquidate your assets and get the hell out of our country. <laughs> that's pretty harsh. Candace, you're, you're badass. In exchange, we'd, we'd extend citizenship to a hardworking legal immigrant. Um, so I would say that Candace and the president are both doing something that is politically very smart. All right, so I'm going, to, I'm going to take two positions. One is, does it work politically? Does it work as a persuasion element? And then secondly, is it a good law? 
you know, as a citizen, what do I think of it? As persuasion, it's kind of brilliant because it forces the other team to argue in favor of burning the flag just so they can disagree with the president. <laughs> and so Candace is, you know, one of the smarter operators in the political world, and I'm sure she understands that it's, it's, a, it's a diabolical trap for the other side, which, by the way, I haven't seen them fall into the trap yet, so maybe they recognize the trap. But even if you don't exactly agree with Candace, and even if you don't exactly agree with the president that such things should be illegal, and I don't, uh, you have to appreciate what it does politically to the other side. It traps them in a corner and makes them argue the thing they don't want to argue, which is, hey, let's, let's have everybody burning that flag. Now, I have a nuanced and superior opinion on this than everybody else. <laughs> That's what everybody says on this topic. The thing about flag burning is it's such a simple topic. It's one of the few topics that we can all understand all of the variables. That's very rare. You know, normally there's something we don't understand about any big topic. But this one, no question. Every person looking at it knows all of the, all of the details you need. So that's just an opinion. So here's my nuanced uh, opinion, which I tweeted at the president. I said, I respectfully disagree. I said, the flag's burnability is exactly what makes it indestructible. I'll get back to that. I'll only pledge allegiance to a flag I can burn in public. No weak flags, please. Now, dumb people read my tweet and said, Scott, it looks like you want to burn a flag. No, no, I don't want to burn a flag. Scott, it looks like you'd be in favor of people burning flags. No, no, I'm not in favor of people burning flags. Scott, it looks like you'd be okay with a flag burning. No, no, I'm not okay with it. I don't like it. I don't want to see it. I wish there were no flag burnings. Can we agree on that? Can we accept that and move on? But flag is a symbol flag is not a bunch of cloth. Uh, if my symbol of freedom, the flag, if I can't burn it, it's not a symbol of freedom. So a flag you can't burn, in, in my view of things, the moment you tell me I can't burn it, I don't respect it. You get that, right? Because free speech and the freedoms that the flag represents are up here, these, these are maximum important concepts. The material of the flag, the fact that somebody's you know, doing something that bothers you, it's very offensive, right? It, I think everybody here would be offended on some level, some a little bit, some more. If you, if you served in the military, the level of offense would be probably through the roof. But being offended, I think everyone would agree that being offended is sort of down in the weeds of importance. You're offended, I'm offended, we're all offended every day about something. That's, that's small ball. What's important? Freedom of speech. Freedom. That's important. So if you tell me you're going to take away my freedom, the top level important thing, freedom of speech in this case, if you're going to take that away from me to protect a piece of cloth, I'm going to find myself a new country. I'm going to find myself a country that gives me freedom of speech because I want the flag that gets stronger when it gets burned. <clears throat> I want the, <clears throat> the anti-fragile flag. I want the one that the worst people in the world can take out into the center of the square and desecrate in every possible horrible way they want to desecrate it and that the, those people, assuming they clean up the litter, I mean, there might be a, a question of litter, but as long as those people can walk away and not go to jail, that's the country I want to live in, even while I don't like those people for doing what they did, even while I'm personally offended by it. Um, I need to live in that country. So that's the high level. Uh, I, th I think that's the high ground on this. Is that So uh, let me reread my sentence because it'll make more sense now that I've explained it. So what I said in my tweet was, the flag's burnability is exactly what makes it indestructible. As long as we can burn it, 
is indestructible. The minute we can't burn it, it's dead to me. It's weak and it's dead. The minute I can't set it on fire. But if you let me set it on fire anywhere I want in this country, as long as I'm not littering, as long as I'm not, you know, as long as I'm not breaking some other unrelated law, as long as I can do that, you've got yourself an indestructible symbol. Can't, can't be destroyed if I can burn it. All right, that's my opinion. Now, with the flag burning stuff, I'm open to the fact that this is just how people feel about stuff. And if you feel strongly about it, you know, for example, if you were in the military and you say to me, you know, I hear what you're saying, Scott, I understand it, you know, in the, you know, sort of uh, blah, blah, intellectual way you're saying it, I understand it. But I fought for this country. If I see somebody burning a flag, I'm going to punch their lights out. Uh, I respect that. You still have to go to jail if you punch somebody in public, but you know what you're getting, right? If somebody fought for the country and they've got a, a far more um, personal relationship with the symbol and they need to take it down on somebody, I don't think you should punch people. But I'm not going to tell you you shouldn't feel that way. So I, I will respect the opinion of people who disagree with me on this topic. All right. Um, I think I hit all of the main points here. Let me just check here. Um, I did. Those are all my main points. How about that? Um, here's the other, here's the other uh, point of view on this flag-burning stuff. I told you that this summer was going to be all silly news. So we're going to have a, an entire summer full of silly news. Uh, and I think this flag-burning thing fits perfectly into that. It's, it's just some silliness that the, the president is injecting because it's good for him. It makes him the protector of the country, the protector of America, etc. cetera. Uh, but it's not important. It really isn't. It's, it's the least important topic that we're going to talk about. Uh, so we'll have a summer of fun, it looks like. And maybe this won't be the summer of love, but it's going to be fun. All right, so a lot of people are asking me in the comments to say something about uh, O.J. So if you don't know, O.J. Simpson has, uh, has opened his Twitter account with a little video introducing his return, and he says he's going uh, he's gonna to be getting back at some people that said some people that said some stuff he didn't like, etc. And here's the best part. He, he wished all the fathers happy Father's Day. <laughs> Happy Father's Day. Oh, man. <laughs> OJ, come on. I don't want to laugh about the tragedy of a murder and you know, the, the poor families that were involved. But seriously, OJ, happy Father's Day? The only thing that could have been hap worse than OJ saying happy Father's Day is OJ saying happy Mother's Day. Am I right? And I don't want to make I don't want to make joke of this, but this is so wrong, like so monumentally wrong that it's so wrong I just have to laugh at it because it's ridiculously wrong. It's wrong. It's not even just you know wrong offensive. It's it's like past offensive. It's like whatever is the offensive times ten that just you just look at it and you go, well, that's just so wrong. That's just so wrong. Uh, anyway, when I, when I checked, he had a quarter of a million followers up from zero in one day. And when I checked back in a few more hours, it was well over 300,000. So he's going to have a really interesting Twitter feed. We'll see how long it lasts. Um, Scott, how's the homeless situation in your country? Not so good but I think we have lots of technologies and ways to fix that. Um, all right. I think that's about all I've got right now. And I think, oh, somebody says county. How is the homelessness in my county? Um, well, I'm on the East Bay, so San Francisco is sort of a, a mess, if you believe the news reports. But where I am in the East Bay... I just don't see it. 
I mean, I, I live in an upscale community, so we just don't have too many problems there. All right, that's enough for now, and I will talk to you all later. Make sure you see this on YouTube in the replay. At uh, just just search for uh, Real Coffee with Scott Adams, and you'll see it on YouTube in the replay. Bye for now.